Would you like to? Okay, there we go. <laughs> I didn't want to be pushy at the beginning. No, I don't want to do that. All right, everybody sing along. I've been to Rome the Moon. I've been to Beach. It's true, too. I've searched all over for a place to pray. I found the mosh pit and knew that this was it. I am a Moshnik and I'm here to stay. And I'm turning gray. Well, actually, turning white. That's what happened to my mom. I found community that is in good with me. Singing and dancing in the zoo. God, some contemplation mixed with elation. I am a Moshnik and I'm here to stay. And I'm turning gray. Hey, hey, come. A chance to meet you, a chance to greet you, Judy Young. A time to deepen what it means to belong. Let's have some fun tonight and spread some joy and light. I am a Moshnik and I'm here to stay. And I'm turning gray. Hop's not here, but here's his. Harmonica. So happy. Apologies to Neil Young. And I think if Neil Young would sue me, we'd get a lot more people coming to us. Because then we'd be famous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alf. Okay, enough of that. All right. Hi, everybody. There's, you know, we are few, but we are the strong. And we're being joined by Elia Alana, Marsha Appel, at, as we speak. Um, so this is just fine with me because my energy is still lacking, having returned to, uh, two weeks and two days ago um, from Israel. I've still got jet lag, but of course, and then on the heels of that, my father-in-law died, and then we had Shiva, and we're just exhausted. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone here, for uh, expressing you know, your condolences and uh, supporting us through this. He was 98, he lived a good long life, uh, but it is, you're never quite prepared, right? Um, when that time comes, and then the then the integration and the kind of like, uh, you know, sifting through uh, the memories start. And, um, you know, as the band sang, you should take what you need and leave the rest. And so uh, that's very much part of uh, of this process too, I think. So for tonight, um, I wanted to uh, just take a look into uh, Pirkei Avot. We have, I don't think we've ever done that before. And um, I, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure there's any of us who don't know um, uh, a few of the, the pithy and wise uh, sayings that are lifted up in Pirkei Avot. Uh, you know, the ethics of the Father or Pirkei are like lines or sayings of uh, Avot. Um, of the ancestors of the rabbis, um, it is uh, there's a Mishnah that's uh, devoted in Thai. That that's what Pirkei Avot is, but it is the only Mishnah without a Gemara. It's the only Mishnah um, that stands alone um, without commentary. Um, now that said, it is true that there's commentary, but the commentary is, was not codified before what the year 600. Uh, which then became the Talmud. Uh, instead, we have a lot of modern commentary, and tonight I'm going to be leaning a little bit into our old friend, uh, Rabbi Rami Shapiro, um, who wrote this book, Pirke, uh, Ethics of the Sages, uh, Pirkei Avot, um, the insightful and engaging wisdom sayings of the rabbinic sages. And of course, Rabbi Rami is going to look at, through it a lot through the lens of, uh, of Buddhist teaching, of, uh, of mindfulness, of... Uh, of how to uh, make a modern sense of uh, some passages that uh, might be a little bit, um, oh, ah, oh, well, like any Torah, <laughs> we can't be certain exactly what it says. And so Reb, Reb Rami, he's the guru of uncertainty. Um, and so we'll we'll travel in that direction with him. Um, I'm also going to, yep, no, well, I'm, 
let me be honest here. I don't have a lot of desk space here. If I did, all of these books would be open in front of me because for some reason through the years, I collected cop different ver copies and uh, uh, different versions of Pierre K. Avot. This is what, written by William Berkson, Pierre K. Avot, Timeless Wisdom for Modern Life. Then I've got a three volume Pierre K. Avot, Ethics from Sinai. Commentary on Pirkei Avot by Irving Bunim. Now, I don't think he's related to Simcha Bunim, but um, this got a lot of uh, classical stuff in it. And then I've got one on my, of course, on my um, on my shelf uh, from Art Scroll, which I'm not using tonight. And then we've got a, a, another one that's uh, um, also leaning towards the more traditional um, by R. Travers Herford, um, which also I'm not going to be opening up because I don't have enough room on my desk. So I'm going to be <laughs> honest about that because they would all be open with, you know, um, <clears throat> with with space savers, page savers in them, but they're not. All right. So I have cherry picked some of uh, some, a, a couple of different um, um, uh, uh, chapters of uh, Pure Kea Vote. Um, most of which I think you, you might be familiar with. So where do we start as with anything? We start from the beginning. Somebody read the Hebrew. This is the very first Mishnah in chapter one of Pirkei Avot. Everybody see it? I can, okay, Scott, you wanna read? Moshe kibel Torah mi Sinai u masara li li Hoshua vi Hoshua li skenim u skenim li nbiim u nbiim misaruha la anshei kneset hagdola hem amru shlosha dvarim evu mitunim badin vahamidu talmidim harbe asu siag la Torah. Okay, thank you, Scott. All right, so let's start from the beginning here. Um, our uh, our lineage, our, our our story, our great myth, of course, begins with Moshe. Uh, and what a wonderful time to uh, look at Pirkei Avot um, on uh, Parshat Shemot, where we uh, we're going to meet Moshe, and of course travel with him through the desert to the very end of our journeys at the end of uh, Devarim. So. Uh, Moshe kibel Torah mi Sinai. Um, Moshe received kibel from the same root of Kabbalah um, uh, to uh, Kabbalat Torah, the reception of Torah. Um, what does this assume about our uh, our quote unquote history, our theology, our um, the, our, our the way that we look at um, at the transmission? What what is this? What are the rabbis just placing in our hands here, uh, at the very very beginning? That that uh, basically saying, you know, this is what was, and we're going to take it from here. But what are we assuming here that we all um, are are, um, are are accepting? Well, it doesn't say Moses got the Torah from God, mm. and it doesn't say what the English says, which is at Sinai. It says he got it from Sinai. So I don't exactly know what that means. <laughs> what was the rest of your question? <laughs> well, you're you're kind of skirt. Hi, Mel. Welcome. You're kind of skirting around the the question, Scott, because even though it doesn't say God, God was there, right? It seems like God. <laughs> right. So who, who who else was Moshe downloading it from, if not um, if not from you know divinity? Okay. So when it says Moshe ki bel Torah mi Sinai. Um, and, and in a little while, we're going to actually take a look at a, a, what I think is a mind-blowing um, uh, Mishnah of uh, the 10 things that were created before this moment, right? So we're going to go backwards, not in time, but before there were, before time and before space. Devora, did you, uh, did you want to say something? Okay. So basically, we need to buy into here that something happened you know, according to Joseph Heller, something happened here. Moshe received something, um, and then it was and tra and then it was transmitted. So Masora, right, is a trans is a transmission, right? A, tr a Masora can also mean tradition. So it, it it was traditioned, right, to 
uh, to Joshua. Now, remember what happens at the end of the book of Devarim. Moshe gives smicha, speaking of smicha ceremonies, right? Gives smicha to Joshua. So when it says transmitted it to Joshua, I remember, I, uh, Rep. Sandy, maybe you were at, the very first Kala I went to was in Jonestown, Pennsylvania, is that where it was? But anyway, I had never met Reb Zalman, Zuchon of Racha, and he stand, he's sitting on stage, and everybody is there. And Reb Zalman says something to the effect, I'm not always going to be with you. Right. right, so right, right. I want to invite you all to close your eyes and put your hands in a receptive position because I'm going to download everything that I know to you. <laughs> well, let me be perfectly clear. Uh, either my receptors were not totally open or something happened as happened to the FAA today. Something got messed up in the transmission. But this is what we're talking about. And a lot of Pure K of Vote deals with transmission from teacher to student. And there are even some Mishnah, uh, Mishnahs about that particular uh, subject as well. Okay, transmits it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the Skenim, all right? And Uskenim the Nevi'im, and they gave it to the prophets, and the prophets to the men of the great assembly, okay? So now we have the beginning of institutionalized life, right? With um, a, an assemblage of, uh, of people called men of the great assembly who are beginning to um, make sense of all of this and making laws um, helping us to come to, come to grips with how do we move from the from the oral so uh, from the written Torah to the oral Torah what 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 do we have to accept uh, and what do we need certainly to investigate and look more closely at in order to to live with it because you're supposed to chai by him right you're supposed to live by him and they said three things right shlosha devarim heim amru shlosha devarim be patient in justice, matunim badin, right? Be, be patient. Okay, so let's take this one at a time. Um, one thing I didn't say before, you know, I did say that there's no Gemara, right? There's no responsive to all of this in Talmudic times. So now we are as, as we want to be to give our own interpretation of what all of this means, as Reb Rami is going to help us with in a minute, and William Berkson as well. So why would it say, Hevu metunim badin, to be patient in the, and then the words administration of justice were added why is that why do they feel you know when you say i'm gonna i'm gonna break it down to three things i'm gonna distill these are the most important things i have to say right now keep in mind there's gonna be other three important things elsewhere sometimes there's gonna be fours uh, be patient in justice what do you make of that anybody why is that important is is patient right that word seems to mean moderation to me. Uh, okay. Um, so the, the Scott is always on the lookout. I'm always on the lookout, sorry. <laughs> or it can mean to- so have patience. Uh, Go ahead. Is that you, you, don't, you don't make a, a judgment in the court without without all of the all of the presentations and we know Talmud this rabbi presents and that rabbi presents if you don't listen to the whole vod then you can be judgmental and exactly. They exactly so you want to take your time to deliberate so you're not jumping to conclusions right away so yeah. there's patience uh in there uh Reb Rami um uh translates that as be careful in judgment. And the comment he makes is that judging is part of life. You know, we're always judging uh, each other, judging others by the way we look and to the, the houses we live in, etc. He says, judging is part of life, but certainty, certainty is not. Be humble in your judging and careful not to mistake hallowed opinion for sacred truth. All right, so don't bring your baggage don't bring your preconceived notions of what is right and wrong, but rather be patient with yourself, 
right? So that truth can rise, right? And, and then decisions can be made from there. Anybody else be patient or be careful? Okay, the next thing. Raise many disciples. Ahamidehu talmidim harbe. So you see the word, uh, the, 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 the shorash ayin mem dalid. It's like um, la'amo to stand up, right? Or we do the amidah, it's a standing prayer. It is to like to raise up, literally, right? To stand, to raise up uh, talmidim, a talmid or is a, is a student. Talmidim harbe talmidim, talmidim harbe, many students. So why? Who is this addressing, first of all? This is addressing the teachers, right? So going back to the very beginning of this, we have teachers transmitting to students, students become teachers who transmit it to students, who become teachers who transmit it to students, and all of that um, is, uh, is demonstrated by all of our presence here. We, have, we are all students and teachers, but some of you are my, are my teachers and some of you are my students and we trade those trade places a lot of the time in doing that so raise up many disciples um, sometimes we have that nice uh, picture of students standing on the shoulders of their of their um, of their teachers now the vision is that students should surpass their teachers that one of the great blessings that any teacher can give us is that you surpass me in wisdom so that wisdom continues to multiply and grow as we make as a transmission makes its way down the line and arami says do not transmit wisdom to replicate what you know in other words does not repeat what i said but to transcend it transcend the it says, so your wisdom is is your chilek your particular piece of, of chokmah, right? Your particular piece that can then take what I teach and take it to a higher madrega, to higher, a higher step. And then finally, the asu siag la Torah. Make a fence around the Torah. Now that, uh, <laughs> That can be problematic at times, depending on how you're judging other communities, right? And the way that they do that. So let's take a look at that for a second. What does that mean, actually, to create a fence around Torah? Now, the word siag can also mean a hedge. So you know what a hedge does um, as far as separating you know, properties. Um, and you can't see over sometimes, see over a hedge. It really keeps you in, but at the same time, what does it do? It keeps others out, right? So a fence serves to both keep people in and people out, but it also is a demarcation, a boundary, right? So what is this about, Siag La Torah, and how does it articulate itself in the communities, the Jew, different kinds of Jewish communities that exist in the world. I was hinting at that a few moments ago. I was thinking, a protect. Why would it be protected? Um, the word, you know, when I think of a fence, I think of protection, but I also think it's also a way of, you know, keeping people out. Mm -hmm. So it just seems so negative under these circumstances. Why would we? keep people out from being close to Torah. Well, if you don't like that, um, that, uh, uh, that uh, image, don't use that image. Yeah. yeah. Use the image of keeping pr protective, a protective fence. Yeah. Of, of, of protecting what's inside the fence, which also can be problematic. Laura. Yeah, I was going to say it. It's a way of maybe not diluting Torah. So keep it as it is and grow it within the, the space, within yeah. our communities. And don't be influenced by, nece necessarily influenced by what's on the outside. Okay, so I'm going to take that another few steps to say that in, in Orthodox communities, especially ultra-Orthodox communities, what's outside that fence doesn't concern them, right? Except the danger is 
what's going on in Israel right now around Jewish identity is not to, because of the way we practice outside of the fence that they have established that we're not Jews, mm. right? And that some of us would not even be able to make Aliyah according to the, the rules that are being um, discussed right now. Okay, so th those fences are only for a certain uh, a, a certain tribe, a certain part of the tribe. You know, we're not just one tribe. We are many tribes, right? Mm -hmm. And which which have many different articulations of our both our religious life and the way that we relate to, to, to Israel. Are you inside the fence or outside the fence, or are you on the fence? And that is. And who gets? Go ahead. Who, say. Who who gets to make the fence then? Who gets to decide? That's right. Who gets to decide um, who, when the fence is moved, when the fence is moved in, or when the fence is made more lenient, right, to to hold others within the larger Klal Yisrael, the people Israel? These are all important questions. Um, and the, the question of who controls the fence is very, very much um, a part yeah. of, of the discussion right now that uh, we're many of us are so worried about of what's going on in, in Israel. Let me share with you what Red Rami says, and he's calling it a hedge. A hedge is a living shield protecting what it surrounds. Ah, so it's alive. Traditionally, the hedge is rabbinic law. Over time, the law is confused with Torah, and an even thicker hedge of words is grown. But wisdom that comes from words alone is Babel. Silence Ooh. is the ultimate shield of Torah. In silence, we can hear the still small voice of God and distinguish tribal norms from timeless truth. Then he says, do not hesitate to challenge the first, meaning the tribal norms, in your pursuit of the second, in pursuit of timeless truth. So he's approaching this a little bit differently than the way that we have been looking at it, except that he acknowledges what we've been talking about, that tri whose tribal norms, <laughs> right? Who gets to say? And then who gets to say who's in and who's out? All of these important. So let's stop for a moment here. Any comments, questions uh, before we move on? Okay, next. All right, so we're going to go back for just for a second and take a look at um, a little more deeply uh, at one of these lines. So um, this is the entire thing up on top. And then uh, this is also Reb Rami. Torah is received from a teacher and transmitted to a student. To receive, you must be empty so as to make room for the teaching. To transmit, <laughs> you must be empty so as not to cling to what you received. And in other words, to be a clear vessel, to be more of a conduit at Sinor, through which um, wisdom flows. The first teaching to receive, you must be as empty so as to make room for the teaching reminds me of that, oh, I think it's a, a is it a Zen story? of the student coming before the uh, Zen master uh, for tea. Is this yeah. right? Jay, you remember the story? Yeah, I think it may, you know, he comes to the Zen master, you know, to for wisdom, although it's quite full of himself and at the Zen master, you know, uh, he says to the Zen master, you're, you're supposed to be the greatest master in all the world and all of that. And, and then Zen master starts to, you know, ask them to pour some tea and doesn't say when does, and he just keeps, he, he, Zen Master keeps pouring the tea and it just overflows. And he says that, you know, before you can learn, you have to empty your mind and, and allow some space in. Right, right. In other words, you're full of it. <laughs> Come back when you're less full of yourself. Yeah, the, the student starts yelling at the Zen Master, stop, 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 because, you know, it's the cup is overflowing. 
And then to transmit, you must be empty so as not to cling to what you received. And so here also is Reb Rami in his, um, I think, a Buddhist stance of, um, you know, to, to live, living in uncertainty is, um, there's more room, again, to not just receive, but to also uh, to also give. And, and I, I think what it also gives to a student is that the teacher is, 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 this is especially when we're not talking about giving over information, right? Their information is information. But when we're giving over, maybe it's the way sometimes when we give over information, but also the, um, the, the, the teachers, just the way the teacher walks in the world you know, of, 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 of having their hands of ready to learn as much maybe from the student as they possibly can. Alrighty, next. Vyasus Yagla Torah, make a fence around Torah. <laughs> you know me, I love finding images. Uh, and this looked very nice. Uh, the horse can't, can't get close to the tree to eat from the lower, lower branches. Uh, and this was the quote from Abrami that I already read. Don't hesitate to challenge tribal norms in your pursuit of truth. So um, before we move on to some other specific uh, Mishnahot, um, here's a, just a couple that you might be familiar with. Um, if not now, when? Sound familiar? Who said it? Somebody? Hello. Hello. Say little and do much. Keep away from an evil neighbor. Love work, hate tyranny. Get yourself a teacher, acquire a friend. The day is short. Render to God what is God's. Now, that should also um, resonate uh, because someone, um, someone else said that, <laughs> who then gave, gave, gave rise to a, uh, you know, another religion. Who are wise? Those who learn from other people. Make a fence around Torah. We already had that. And then turn the Torah over and over again. That's, that's the only time that uh, Rabbi Bagbag is uh, quoted in all of this, for it contains everything. Who haya omer? Im ein anili mili. Who's the who? <laughs> who is this referred to? You already said, somebody already said it. Oh, it was, uh, it was uh, Reb Sarah. It was Hillel, right? Hillel haya omer im ein anili mili. You're on the wrong slide. I am? Oh, how? Oh, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Would you like me to be spotlighting for this, Reb Mark? Well, do, does everybody need spotlighting for this to be uh, larger? You know, you you all can spotlight me. You could just uh, click it on active speaker if you want me to get bigger. Um, I like to see everybody, so I always change okay. it. Anyway. Who, Haya Omer? Who is who? <laughs> Hillel is who. Im ein anili mili. If I am not for myself. Im ein anili mili. Who is for me? Uksha anili atzmo. If I'm only for myself. Mani. If I'm only for myself, what am I? And then, of course, for loakshav imatai, and if not now, when? So uh, I hear a song coming on. Im anili mili. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? Shani lets me. Mani, if I am only for myself, what am I? Vim lo akshav, hey and if not now, if not now, when? Let's do it again. Everybody sing it. Vim anani li, me li. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? Shani leatmo, mahani. If I am only for myself, vim lo achav And if not now, if not now.
uh, Red Romney's going to have a really nice, I think. Um, let me see if I put it on the next page. Yes. A nice take on this. If I am not for myself, I'm Anili, Mili, Mili, who, who is for me? So being for yourself is honoring Mochin de Katnut, the narrow mind of the relative self. You've heard, you know, we, we've used that uh, uh, expression many, many times. A uh, Moach is uh, your brain. Uh, so the Katnut, the Katan, small. So small mindedness, but it doesn't mean that in this um, context. It really means, um, it really means uh, taking care of yourself in the way that you need to be taken care of. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, walking with blinders on, but it, uh, as the rabbis teach, um, you know, the, the Yetzirah hurrah is necessary, the so-called evil inclination, because without it, we wouldn't build a house, we wouldn't pursue a profession, you know, we wouldn't raise uh, a family. And all of those things are important I impulses, or we, we, life as we know it, um, uh, literally would not continue on. But that said, and as what he says, honoring narrow mind means seeing to the welfare of the body, heart, and mind. Meaning of your, if so this is self-care, really, but at the same time, it is also pru or vu, you know, it is, you know, uh, be fruitful and multiply. But, right, but um, if, uh, if, if I'm only for myself, what am I? Right. So if I'm only that, if I'm only living in Moachin de Katnut, he says, this is the balance that one needs to live in, is living in Moachin de Gadlut, Gadol, in a larger, more expansive field of vision, balancing being for yourself with being for others. Right. So being in service to God, you know, even with Tashem Basimcha, we can't do that unless we are and we've we take care of ourselves right and so those things have to live in careful balance spacious mind continuing that sees all things as part of the one okay now we're moving into a little bit more of of, of thisness right of extending our arms of being able to see each other made B'Tselem Elohim made in the image of God it's only when our eyes are fully open to see that in each other that then I can see it in myself and it's reflected in you and reflected in the next person and it it just reverberates um like you're throwing a stone you know in, uh, into a still pond Living from spacious mind is living without fear and the anger, greed, violence, and injustice that fear carries with it. This reminds me of many, uh, it reminds me of Dr. King, right? Of not living in with the fear, not allowing fear to stop us from what needs to happen. And we can't be in touch with what needs to happen unless we're living in Moachin de Godlut, with spacious mind, which embraces embraces all embraces all being part of a living organism if i'm only for myself what am i let me go back okay all righty so now I'm moving to chapter two and like i said i'm i kind of chair look through it and i said oh yeah i like that one <laughs> i want to i want to sh share this tonight Rabbi Tarfon Omer. Rabbi, before you go on. Go ahead, Judy. Um, I just I just am mulling over the previous passage and thinking that to me this resonates with the fact that we live in more than one world. Um, you know, the I'm seeing like the world of Asiya, the world of Bria, you know, that we are we are part of different worlds sort of simultaneously. That's yeah. that's where that's where my mind is going with this. I'm just wondering if it resonates that way with anybody else. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> <laughs> when you say that, actually, um, it what resonates for me is um, Rabbi Cook, Rav Cook's uh, fourfold blessing. 
of the of of starting with yourself then you're in your tribe then you're in your country then you're in your land then you've got the whole world included so it it it, it what's that world it um, like a stone on there it, it ripples out it into existence so it's it's i i think it's even uh it encompasses that as well as what you're saying judy that uh, comes all four worlds of of existence um asiya uh yitzira bria atzilut and living in you know in that in other words you can't live in atzilut all the time right, uh, right? <laughs> and that's not even desirable to do that but there is something to be accomplished not just in each of those worlds but in the balance in, in the in a healthy balance between those four worlds so that is the individual, right? And then you take Rob Cook's teaching together with that. I think it makes a beautiful piggyback on, on your comment on then how the individual then radiates out into beyond the fence of one's own you know, Torah, right? And for us not to be so, to treat it so um, like it's going to break. Our Torah is going to always be strong, but you know, I, this is where you know, our Jewish renewal and our deeply ecumenical, I think, vision comes into play, that we recognize that we are part of a larger, uh, a larger dream, a larger uh, experiment. Devorah, did you have something you wanted to add? Devorah? Oh. You were unmuted, that's why. <laughs> that's okay. Sandy? Just, just, do you all know what I'm talking about? I mean, I have it here on my computer. Rob Cook, let me see if it comes up right away. Uh, I mean, if I Googled it. Ah, here we go. The four songs of Rav Cook. Uh, let me see if the whole thing is here. It's really beautiful. Um, no, I don't want that. No, nope, I can't get into it. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> but if you look up the four songs of, he says that there are, there are four songs that are part of existence. And that one is the song of the self, the song of the nation, the song of the country, and then the song of the world. I think those are the four. Okie dokie. Rabbi Tarfan, the day is short and the work is plentiful. Hayom Katsar Vamlacha Muruba. A poalim atseilim. And the laborers are indolent, but atseilim it basically means lazy, right? And the reward is great. Ashar Harbe Uvalabayat Dochek. A dochek, the the balabayat, the person, the one who's in charge, is knocking, right? Is insistent that the work uh takes place. So um uh, this first thing uh, saying of Rabbi Tarfon, uh, you might look at it as a little bit, uh, you know, you know, not negative, but oh man, that's a drag. <laughs> you know, we don't have time to do our work. There's more work that we can ever possibly do. The laborers, that's us, are lazy, and the reward, Ashar Har, is great, and the one who's in charge is insistent that the work gets done. All right, so um, I, I, I want to invite anybody or us all to drosh on this for a second. Like, what's going on here? What is he, like, what is he really talking about? Is he talking about day laborers? I don't think so. I think he's talking about something else. What, and what is that? He's talking about doing God's work in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the, what's the schar? What's the reward? Well, I, I thought differently. Okay, go ahead. I saw it as uh, the laborers are indolent is that of the study of Torah, people are being lazy about studying Torah. There you go. Uh huh. Absolutely. If you study Torah, the rewards, the rewards are great. And what's the reward? <laughs> I don't see your page, so I can't read it. Okay. What it doesn't say what the reward is. All it says is Haskar Harbe. It just says that the reward is great. What is the reward? 
It's a connection with the divine. Okay, so you hold on to that, uh, Sandy. Scott, what's the traditional reward? Well, I, I don't know, but I was going to say Torah for its own sake, right? Oh, right. okay. Uh, that absolutely is a great answer. I didn't think about that for sure. Um, I think the reward is Olam Haba. Yeah, you go. A chelek v'olam haba. Or as my friend, Elise Seiner Joseph, a stake, S-T-E-A-K, in the world to come. <laughs> I, I, she, she eats a lot of flesh, what can I tell you? But yeah, so that's the traditional understanding of this. But and and that the master of the house, the Baal Habayit, who's the master, master of the house, take her all the time. Do, 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 the master of the house, of course, is is Hashem, right? So and Hashem is going to assist that your work gets done. But what is the work that you are hinting at, Sandy? Is spiritual work. All right. So here, the, the traditional way of looking at it is, yes, the work is Torah. There's more Torah that we're, that we're ever going to be able to not only study, but also in, in, but, but hold on to and integrate. You know, they say you have to go over things how many times? 10, 15 times before you remember it. For me, it's way long, longer than that. Listen to um, Reb Rami, because Reb Rami is going in the direction that you are, Sandy. He says, this is Rabbi Tarfon's analogy of the spiritual quest. The day is short, meaning there is only this moment. The task is long, for the distance between Moachin de Katnut and Moachin de Godlut, narrow mind and spacious mind, appears immense to move from this to that. The workers are lazy, it means that this challenge seems too great. The stakes are high. The very salvation of person and planet depends on it. So he's raising the stake. It's We're not just talking about salvation. We're talking about our very own planet. And there he's, and there he's borrowing, not literally, from Rav Cook's four songs because we are part of the larger song. Each of those four songs of Rav Kook are, 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 are part and parcel with the next song. They're not individual songs, they're the ones that build upon the next. And then Rami says, God, uh, the master is demanding, right? Uh, it says Balabai Tochek, that he's not, that he's knocking, like he, he's um, insistent is, is probably a great word. God accepts nothing but the whole, hesitate, and you are lost. <laughs> and I suspect what he means by that is if you hesitate, if you don't somehow have a spiritual practice that brings you back to this truth uh, that Adonai Echad every day, and you don't have the capacity to return there every day, you're, you, you live with the feeling of separation. And that is I'm, I'm not sure there's anything more awful or downward spiral uh, than that. Okay, let's stop for a second. Um, although we're about, I promise, we're about to get to Rabbi Tarfon's antidote <laughs> to this, or maybe it's a little better news. Let's do that first, the bottom of the page. Hu haya omer. So wherever, you see this is um, at the top of the page, this is um, uh, 2, 15, and 16. It's a... Uh, the fifteenth chapter of the of the second Mishnah, uh, and then this 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 next one at the bottom of the page is, is in the sixteenth chapter. Wh whenever a chapter begins with who, meaning he, uh, he would say, um, it's referring to the rabbi who was quoted in the preceding chapter. So this means it's also uh, Rabbi uh, Tarfan. So Rabbi Tarfan, hi Ohio Mayor. Lo alecha hamlacha ligmor, lo alecha ligmor. Does sound familiar? Lo alecha hamlacha ligmor, lo alecha ligmor. Velo, velo ata ven chorin levatel mimena. Velo ata ven chorin. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 velo, velo, ata, ven charin, livatel mi mena, velo, ata, ven charin, lo alecha hamlacha, ligmor. It is not upon you, 
the malacha, ligmor, to finish the work. That's the work that he referred to, the work of Torah, the work of serving God, whatever your chelak in this lifetime is, your particular work, it's not upon you to, to complete it, which can really get a lot of us down. I'm never going to complete this, right? We're never going to see the day when this will happen, that will happen. But that's not the point, because you, then you go way back to the beginning in the very first chapter. This is all about transmission and handing things over and passing it on. So you're, but even though it's not your duty to finish, below a you're not, you're not, um, you don't have the freedom. You're not at liberty to like cancel yourself, to remove yourself, or to neglect it. Right. So we have to be immersed in the work. But don't get don't get so bogged down that you're not going to complete. We're never going to complete our work. Is basically what he's saying. And so, um, you know, sit with that, breathe into it, chill, and do your work with passion and uh, with with dignity and with ferocity, and uh, you'll be in good good shape in passing it on to the next generation. It's all about transmission. Any words of wisdom from uh, from anyone? Any comments, thoughts? Judy, you do. I'm wondering if it bothers me that this is only um, about Torah study. Uh, well, and, and not that not the Torah study doesn't have its own reward. Yeah, but I think that where where this is is bothering me is okay so why are we studying torah is it just so we can enjoy the pleasure of studying torah or is it is it so that we can um make the world a better place all right this is great that's a great question because i'm gonna isn't this about justice justice shall you see it's yes it's all about everything What's that movie I haven't seen yet? Um, everything is every. What, what's uh, uh, everything? Oh, everything all the time. Oh, it's a great movie. Yeah, right. It's, it's yeah. Movie. Here it's a great movie. I haven't seen it yet. All right. So Judy, I think Rami uh, addresses exactly what your question. The reward for study, the scar. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean Torah study, and but okay but any acquisition of wisdom from whatever the source remember we can call that torah we don't we're not necessarily talking about hot torah any my my bookshelf is filled with torah right and and so is yours the reward for study is awakening to spacious mind and returning to your true nature as the image and likeness of god this is not a matter of quantity but quality the effort is what turns you, not the knowledge gaining, gained from it. So, yes, we will never study all the so we need to study. We'll never gain all the knowledge that there is to be gained in the world, right? But we pray that the knowledge opens our eyes, including our third eye, so we can see with more expansiveness that, you know, that not only am I made in the image of God, which I might not even see without doing that, but you too. And not just you too, but the person down the block and not just the person down the block. And then once you, everything starts, I think everything's saying everything starts there. And that's where we need to constantly return to, right? But we get lazy. How do I get lazy? I get lazy because I'm I'm not as disciplined as I, sometimes I'd like to be. Right? Sometimes I need to veg out in front of the TV and watch you know Tom Clancy movies. Right? I need that kind of break too. Um, but let's face it, this kind of insistence that God has, I can't worry about. I can listen as closely as I can and do my best job, without falling into the trap of feeling that I'm not worthy of carrying on. Um, Mira, help me here. So uh, one of the things that it, um, brings to mind for me is, um, you know, so I've been active in environmental work. Yes. And, um, it's, 
there's definitely too big, it's too big of an issue and too, you know, it's overwhelming in terms of the, you know, actually making a difference. But um, there's a, a phrase called active hope by Joanna Macy, who just, it's how to keep moving and keep doing the work without knowing the outcome of it. And that's what this reminds me of that you have to just continue to do what you can. And and um, that, you know, gives you, uh, you know, if everybody did that, then may, there might be some, you know, some real big changes that'll occur. So it's yeah. everybody. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. As a matter of fact, I should listen to what I say because I think I actually, used Act of Hope last past Shabbos, didn't I? And I was talking about, um, I sang a little bit of Hatikva. Uh, was that this past Shabbos or, or, or the two, sh I, I lose track. But that being part of the DNA, DNA of our people, or else we wouldn't have lasted this long, right? When we, when we, when we talk about Mashiach and you know, Messiah, are we really talking about, um, are we really talking about a person who's going to come as, as some think that the Messiah has already come in the form of Jesus. Uh, are we really talking about that or are we talking about a, a carrot on a stick that leads us, that, that keeps us going because we have to, you know? Um, and and then, I mean, I, no, I can get into the whole Messiah thing. Never mind. <laughs> Not going there. Next. <laughs> All right. Akavia Ben Mahalalel. 3-1. Why did I choose? Oh, yeah, because this is intense. Uh, oh, remember we had before, we had three things. Here's another three things. Mark well three things, and you will not come into the power of Avera, the power of sins. Okay, these are the things you should know. Know from where you come. And where you're going. And before whom you are destined to give an account and reckoning. Okay, so this is all good. And if we can embrace that, you know, we came from our source and we're going to return to the source. This is easy stuff. But may I in bata miti pas rucha, where you would come from, from a putrid drop. From a putrid drop. Yes, my friends, this is referring to semen. And where are you going? to a place of dust, of worm, and of maggot. Oh, if this doesn't lift your spirits, I don't know what does. Before whom are you destined to give an account and reckoning? Before the king of kings. HaKadosh Baruch Hu. All righty. This should sound a little, th th this should um, remind you of, of something. Uh, which is the other side of the coin from uh, Bishvili um, about Nifraha uh, Ulam, the world was made for me. So what is the other side of that coin, the other petek, the other little piece of scrap of paper we're supposed to carry? It says what? I'm just ashes, but dust and ashes. I'm just dust and ash. Right? I'm just dust and ash, right? So what happens when we know this? <laughs> what happens when we know this? Well, I think we know that our time is short. I think we know that, uh, you know, that um, from whence we, from whence we came to, you know, from, from dust to dust, right? And that we weren't so much at the beginning, you know, don't think so much of yourself. So this is a, 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 a test of our humility here, um, as oftentimes, you know, these uh, kind of uh, um, teachings are, but it is all for a specific reason, right? Um, and to, to not to fall into, um, into habitual behavior into falling into the same trap of making the same mistake over and over again of um of exposing ourselves to bad bad karma right 
of, of things that we do in this lifetime, they're going to carry over into other lifetimes, perhaps. There's a lot of different ways to, to look at this. Um, and I'm trying to remember which one of these I bookmark. Okay, it wasn't that one. Okay, this is this is the, the, the problem of not having a big enough desk in front of me. Like, hold on a second. Let me just see. Ah, okay. But this is... This tends to be how um, Pirkei Avot goes. It bounces back and forth between um, uh, teachings that make us go, oh God, <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> this is what I really need to be centering on. And then teachings that uh, are really down to earth and, uh, and things that we can use. And then of course, teachings that lift us up, right? Um, this particular teaching, I think, can do either or. You know, it, it can keep us keep us in balance, that's for sure. So let's move on to the next one. We're still in chapter three. Who haya omer? Who is who? Well, it's not necessarily a caveat because this is not the next um, Mishnah. Beloved is man, for he was created in the image of God. Pardon me for using gendered language. Especially beloved is he for it was made known to him that he had been created in the image of God, as it is said, for in the image of God, he made man. It's, I think this is just another proof that the, the, the way in which Pirkei Avot moves is like back and forth between Moachin de Katnut and Moachin de Gadlut, right? Being realizing that we're made in the image of God when we're seeing it more expansively and when we're receiving more of Katnut, we are going back to um, this whole thing about we came from a putrid, you know, a putrid drop, right? Um, but it keeps it keeps us honest. Beloved are Israel, and that oppressor's vessel was given to them. Especially beloved are they, for it is made known to them that the desirable instrument for which the world had been created was given to them, as it is said, for I give you good instruction, forsake not my teaching. Now you should know that last line, right? Ki tov natati lachem. That's the end of the Torah service, right before we sing, Eitz chayim hi, right? So the precious vessel, shenitain lehem kli, right? Chemda, shabo nivraha olam, with which um, uh, was, the world was created. That, of course, is talking about Torah, which now Judy Young is going to share her um, video. She's going to say, I don't like it. That's all about referring to Torah. But let's give that a more, exp sometimes we, we, we're, we're going to speak specifically of Torah because this is our heritage. Um, for I give you good instructions, you know, I'm giving you something good. And so don't turn your back on it because it's going to take you to that place of which is where Rami wants us to go. Mitzvah, uh, where is it? Mitzvah, Gorera, Mitzvah, Avera, Gorera, right? So this, there's another tune here, which I'm forgetting right now. Ben Azai Omer. Be quick in performing a minor commandment as in the case of a major one. So you, if there's a big commandment, a big mitzvah that you have, you know, we all got to run to do it. But if there's one of lesser significance, you should do that with the same amount of vigor. And the same goes with fleeing from transgression. Why? Because it establishes behavior. One Commandment leads to another. Mitzvah, goreret mitzvah. They build upon each other at the same time. Bad behavior, you know, we know that. <laughs> for us overeaters uh, who eat too close to bedtime and know we shouldn't. For us, um, you know, there are all kinds of things that we know we do. And not only are they not good for us, but it leads us doing something else that's not good for us. So this just seems like, okay, this is very, very usable stuff. So Sakhar mitzvah, as Scott Ryder reminds us, the, the, the reward for a mitzvah is the opportunity to do another mitzvah and the schar from an avera what's the reward you get for that <laughs> yeah this is what you get for that right? you get a zet you you get um something that is not going to um feed your neshama 
right? It's going to uh, put schmutz on the windshield wiper of your soul. I think we should sing the song. Go ahead, Judy. Mitzvah gareret mitzvah, avra gareret avra. Mitzvah gareret mitzvah, yada da da da, yada da da da. Thank you. I forgot the second part of it. Yeah, mitzvah gareret mitzvah. Avera, 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 da 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 da, something like that. <laughs> I tried, but I, I had forgotten it. What, what, what's the map? Oh, the map. Oh, thank you, Scott, for noticing. Ben Azai Omer. I think I walked by Ben Azai Street. Um, it's near. It's in Baca, right? It's right off of Emek Rafaim. It's in that neighborhood. I can't, I can't increase this, but when I did, when I clicked on it, uh, uh, I was reminded, well, you said the German colon, colony is right there. And so really, it's literally a block from, uh, from Emma Grafahim. And I was there just two weeks ago. Robert Burns. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. And first we practice to deceive. Well, interestingly, um, I, 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 um, I looked online and I thought it was accredited to Robert Burns, but Walter Scott was also given credit for this. So I don't know who says it, but this is referring back, of course, to to here and Avera Goreret Avera, that when we um, we can create a tangled web for ourselves that we get caught in, and then we can't find a way out. And now this is bringing us into the home stretch here of the ten things that were created before Bereshit bara Elohim, right? Before, um, before Simtum, you know, before uh, God makes space for other. Asara devarim shnivru be'erev Shabbat. So this is at twilight, right? Right at the, that, that magical time, right? Between the end of the day at Erev Shabbat, right? Right at that place. Right before Shabbat says, Bain Hashmashot, the Elohim. So these are the ten things that are embedded in the in the DNA of reality. And um, after each thing, uh, someone tell me if you um, know what it's referring to. So these are the things that um, that divinity needed to make sure were going to happen. Right, that maybe um, was set up uh, for the chain of events to the, these things to be ready to go. Piha Aretz, the mouth of the earth. What is that referring to? Anybody? Where when Korach, the, Korach, Korach and its followers were swallowed up. So Korach and his swallowers get swallowed up. The, the earth opens and swallows them up in the in the machloket, you know, with. Uh, that's not l'shem hashemayim. That's not machal l'shem shem hashemayim. Not for the sake of heaven. Ufi uh, habe'er, the mouth of the well. The Joseph and, story. Uh, uh, no. Think Miriam. So Miriam, of course, is giving credit. What happens the minute that Miriam dies in the very next pasuk? Go ahead, Devor. They don't have the, her well anymore, so they have no water. Exactly. And so, so this this is referring to uh, the well that Miriam always had uh, access to, that she alone um, could divine, right? Ufi ha'aton. Talking donkey. There you go. Who says Torah is not funny? Vahakeshet. <laughs> Self-explanatory. Right. No, it's hard. Right. And and the uh so did you say what did you say? The ark right, the, you said the after ark. The, after the ark, right. That's interesting that you said the ark instead of the rainbow, because when you said ark, I thought ARC, 
which was oh, it's the shape that the rainbow makes, right? So one of the, the Midrashim is that the, uh, the rainbow is shaped like that because if you shape it the other way, it, it's, it looks more like a, a bow, as a bow and arrow. And it's part of the promise that, um, that God makes never to be um, uh, aiming God's metaphorical arrow towards us. Uh, for Haman, the manna, of course, uh, the double portion on uh, Friday. The staff, for Hamate. What staff is that referring to? Moses. Moshe's, Moshe's staff. The Shamir, and it's not talking about Yitzchak. Is that, is that the, uh, the mollusk? Go ahead. What, what does it do? Yeah, something blue. <laughs> oh, no, no. no? You think of something else. Okay. It has something to do with a mollusk. I, I'm not well, sure. Well, it is a, um, uh, not prehistoric. It's a, uh, a myth. It's, it, it's part of the myth that the stones used to create Solomon's temple were not to be carved with any kind of metal, any weapon of war, right? Thing, any material that a weapon war can be made into. So the Shamir is a mythological creature who could somehow <laughs> carve out the stone that was needed for um, the, te- the walls of the temple. The Haktav, the letters. So what letters are referring to? Don't look too deeply. It's uh, this, uh, yeah? On the Ten Commandments? Uh, no, even simpler than that. The letter. What? What are the letters? The alphabet. The alphabet. Right. The letters. The letters. And then the inscriber or the tool to engrave hamichta, and then of course the luchot, the tablets, which is really interesting. Um, it's like, where, where did those tablets come from? Were they just waiting for Moshe? When Moshe Moses climbs, you know, c- climbs at the mountain for his tete-a-tete with uh, divinity. Um, so I, I'm not, sh- I haven't r- studied any further into what it's referring to and where were these luchot. Um, uh, and I'm assuming it's referring to the first set of tablets and not the second set of tablets. But also the tool. What is what kind of a tool is used? Going back, Moshe, right to, to the very beginning of us. Moshe received Torah from Sinai, and when he receives it, he needs somehow to inscribe it on the luchot. We don't know. Biad Moshe. That's all it says, right? Hazot, Torah, Asher, Samosha, right? Yisrael, Viad Moshe by the hand of Moshe. Was it his hand? Here it's it is more than hinting at that there was before Bereshit Bar Elohim ten things created. And those ten things included the tool with which Moshe would need to inscribe the letters onto the Luchot. And that, my friends, is our uh, dive into our, our, our shallow dive <laughs> into Pirkei Avot. You know, some people study this. If you look at a uh, conservative a Sidur, um, it is in the conservative Sidur for study on Shabbat afternoon. Uh, it's, 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 so it's part of uh, Shabbat, traditional Shabbat afternoon um, study. Um, and uh, so now we've uh, taken a little, a little dive into it. And I'm, I'm happy that we did because it gave me a chance to go over some things that uh, I haven't looked at in a while. Uh, any thoughts, comments before we uh, say good night? Scott? I, I'm pondering the last one again. Yeah, you um, want me to put it back up? Yeah, if you want. Because it says these are the, thi- the things that were created at the end of creation, right? Right yeah. before God had six days. And this is on the cusp of this end, end of the, the sixth day that these strange things were created after everything else was created. Um, I don't know exactly what to do with that. I mean, one thing that jumped into my head was, oh, you had to have these things so a lot of the stories would make sense or would happen that follow, you know? Because if there was no donk- talking donkey, you couldn't have that story. If there was no, you know, rainbow, you couldn't have the story. It was almost like God said, ooh, 
Oh, wait oh, a minute. I got to do these. <laughs> well, you know, I think you're throwing a, a further wrench into this because if Torah is, if the Torah is created before there's a before, if Torah is the blueprint, right, for all that was, is, and will be, isn't everything already written? And is, is what you're saying um, a, 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 um, a, a logical leap that <laughs> divinity goes, whoops, wait, I left a couple of things out. Let me just toss these in there to, and they'll pop up when needed, like a mad libs, you know? Right. But on the other hand, you know, there's no before and after. There's uh, no before and after, right? Right. Absolutely. That's what Rashi says. There's no before and after. And like everything is happening, everything is everything, everything is happening all at once. And if you del del on that to dwell on that too long, your head will explode, Devorah. <laughs> Thanks. So I would like to know the timeline then, because in Rosh Hashanah, we talk about the fact that God created Teshuva before anything else. Why is that not on the list? Yeah, and why is not? It's the not a physical thing. Why is not the Malach, the angel at the sea, um, there, that's also, so maybe there's a different set of 10. And sometimes you find that in different sources, um, right? You have different sets, just like there's different understandings of uh, across traditions of uh, what are the quote unquote 10 commandments, right? And, and uh, you know, singing it to the higher, you know, um, the higher trope and the lower trope divides it up differently. It's all good questions. Great. Judy left yeah, but off. I want a timeline. I, I want a timeline on this. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Einstein for that. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. So that's why we need to lend our imagination to a lot of this in order for it to have meaning, in order for it to use it, in order for us to continue to transmit it, you know, at a, to the to whoever our students are at whatever time. All right, my friends, uh, we are few, but we are mighty. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, did you want to say something here before we bid adieu? Well, I was thinking of the first one that you you uh, quoted tonight. The first uh, Mishnah. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll About go. how how that has stood the test of time, how that has spread into the popular culture. I I find that interesting. That one had more lasting. You mean this one? No. Uh, no. Then if not for me. Oh, if not, uh, right. Imain Ani Levi Mili. This one. Okay. If I'm not for who's me, but if I'm only for myself. But that one has has really resonated and it's really taken over in the popular culture. And I just was uh, you know, I was just uh just thinking about that, how how that stood the test of time. For sure. And I think that resonates with what uh, Reb Sandy brought up before about uh, justice, ju uh, uh, you know, tzedek, 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 dear dove, justice, justice, you you shall pursue. If that is the ikar, if that is the most important thing we have to keep our eyes on, this is a proof text for that. Right? Um, so, it, <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. And then, of course, it became more popular because... Uh, um, Debbie Friedman put it to music, uh, uh, but yes, very important uh, in, in in any realm that we happen to be um, addressing. So at this point, we have a, a guest who likes to say.